Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. I'm glad you're here. Yes, sir. Are you ready for the word? Yes, sir. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Two weeks ago, we talked about Halloween and whether it could be used as an evangelistic outreach tool or not, and we concluded that it is futile to, to yeah. try and do so. Yes, sir. Last week, uh, we talked about why I refuse to baptize Halloween. Right. This week, we're going to continue talking about Halloween, and uh, this week, what I want to do is I want to give you umpteen reasons why we should not participate in Halloween. Yes, sir. Umpteen reasons why we should not participate in Halloween. You in 2 Corinthians chapter 6? Yes, sir. Let's begin in verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what concord hath the Messiah with Belial? Or what part has he that believes with an infidel? And what agreement has the temple of Yahweh with idols? For we are the temple of the living Elohim. As Elohim has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their Elohim. They shall be my people. Wherefore, come out. From among them, and be ye separate, says Yahweh. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says Yahweh Almighty. So let's go over umpteen reasons. Yes, sir. Most of them listed here as to why we should not participate in Halloween. Number one. Because to try to join ourselves to Halloween is an unequal yoke. Yes, the yoke would be unequal. What does it say in verse 14? Does it say yoke up with unbelievers in hope of reaching them with the gospel? Yes, sir. Does it say that we should take the things they love to do and do those things so that we can have an opportunity to witness to them? No, sir. No, what does it say? It says be not unequally yoked together. Strong says that means to associate discordantly to associate discordantly here's what that means it means to try and make two things that are in conflict associate together the bible says do not take two things that are in conflict with one another and try to make them join together and associate together you you wouldn't take an ox and yoke him up with a donkey right you wouldn't take an ox and yoke him up with a chihuahua. Right. <laughs> Those two things are in conflict. You cannot take them and associate them together. You cannot take that which belongs to the devil and associate it with things that belong to Yahweh. The instruction is don't do that. Do right. not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Do not join yourself in any way with unbeliever. An unbeliever is anyone who is not associated with or uh, a part of the faith. It's anyone who is outside of the faith. Halloween did not come out of Torah. No, sir. So it did not come out of the faith. Right. Right? It came out of the pagan worship of the Celts. I know the last two weeks, I think, I've been talking about the Celts. That's because that's the way it's spelled, C-E-L-T. <laughs> but, but they're actually the Celts. And, and it's the Celts and their uh, pagan priests who were called the Druids. Who, who came up with this evil pagan practice. It came from Satan himself. Right. It's where it came from. And these pagan priests promoted it. And it has continued through thousands of years up to the day where it is being revived yes, it is. in our day and time. It's connected with darkness and connected with demons. 1 Corinthians 10 says, You cannot drink the cup of the Messiah and the cup of devils. It's the same point being made here in 2 Corinthians 11. You can't be yoked together with them. You can't take these two things that are in conflict and bring them together. You can't drink the cup of the Messiah and the cup of devils. <clears throat> there are umpteen reasons to not participate in, in Halloween. The first one is simple. 
There is no way to make the true worship of Yahweh be in agreement with a festival that's about devils, about demons, and about the spirits of the dead. Right. It's impossible. Right. Let's go look at an illustration of this. Go to Numbers 25. <coughs> Numbers 25, you there? Almost. Hello, Carla and Johnny and Lisa. And wow. <coughs> Willie? Anyway, we welcome them. Amen. Uh, to the service this morning. Numbers 25, you there? Yes, sir. Verse 1. And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. Now, you look at word daughters up there, you go to. Uh, Numbers 21, you'll find a, a few places in Numbers 21 where that is translated as the villages. So you could read it that way. They begin to commit whoredom with the villages of Moab. All right, drop down to verse 2. They called the people unto the sacrifices of their Elohims, and the people did eat and bowed down to their Elohims. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor, and the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Israel. It, it is not that they fell prostrate on their faces and worshiped the Elohims of Moab. No, if you read it, the issue is, here's the issue, they did eat of those sacrifices offered to those pagan deities. And in the eating of those sacrifices, they are literally submitting themselves or bowing down, acknowledging, giving some kind of reference, a, a reverence and acknowledgement of those pagan deities. The eating was fellowshipping. That's, I just quoted 1 Corinthians 10. Paul's talking in 1 Corinthians 10 about whether you ought to eat meat sacrificed to idols or not. And Paul's making the point where you can't drink the cup of the Messiah and the cup of uh, devils. You can't do both. you got to do one or the other. Well, here it says they did eat, and the eating that they did was fellowshipping with pagan deities, pagan gods. The eating caused them to be linked to or joined together with those gods. This brought about the down, their own damnation and their death. Right. Do, you, do you know why the villages of Moab Moab invited them to the festivals? Do what now? Why did they think that would make them weak? Because a prophet had instructed them to do so. Remember Balaam? Yeah. The king of Moab at the time was a guy by the name of Balak. Balak, remember, called Balaam. Right. Wanted him to curse the Israelites right. so he could beat them in a fight. He said, I'll pay you big money. And Balaam tried to curse them and couldn't. He offered him more money. Uh, he tried to curse them and couldn't because he couldn't curse what Yahweh had blessed. Right. But Balaam knew something that would be of value to Balak. Right. And that is, though I cannot curse them because Yahweh has blessed them, they can bring a curse upon themselves. And all you have to do is get them to come and participate in your activities in the worship of your deities, and their Elohim is a jealous Elohim, and it will kindle his anger against them. Right. If you want to destroy them, get them to just come eat with you out of the sacrifices you offer to your Elohim. Yeah. That's the reason they did it. Go to Revelation 2 for a moment. Even when you get to the end of the book, it is still criticizing that mindset that Balaam had. <clears throat> Revelation 2, verse 12, And the angel and to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he which has the sharp sword with two edges. I know your works and where you dwell, even where Satan's seat is. You understand they are in a dangerous place. And you hold fast my name and you have not denied my faith. He's bragging on them, isn't he? Yes? Yes? Okay. 
Even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you because you have there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Balaam taught Balak to cast a stumbling block. He taught Balak how to make the people stumble. Yeah. He taught compromise through seduction. You seduce them to come in and participate. You make it fun enough to them that they can't refuse it. And when they come in and start doing that, they will stumble and fall before their Elohim, yeah. before Yahweh. Wow. The message that, that Balaam and Balak delivered was not forsake Yahweh. That message would have been rejected. Right. The message was, let's all just get along. Yeah. The message coming from Moab to Israel is, come eat with us. Let's all be friends. We need to have yeah. unity. We can find, surely we can find some common ground where we can fellowship together. Yeah. That was the message that Moab <coughs> sent to Israel, and that message destroyed Israel. Right. Verse 15, so hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate, repent, or else I will come unto you quickly, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcomes while I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knows, saving he that received it. So the message of the Messiah to this assembly is what? What's his message to? Not a trick question. What's the message the Messiah had to this assembly? What do they need to do? Repent. Change. Turn. Stop. Notice again, this assembly was located in a very hostile environment. Notice they were doing a lot of things right. Notice that, that, that they were right in the heart of where Satan had set up camp, but, but they were being strong. They were holding to his name. They were willing to die for him. Some of them even did die for him. Messiah even says, man, this is the place where Satan camps out. He, he loves this city. Yeah. That did not give them a pass on being unequally yoked together. He said, I know where you're at, and I know the good things you've done, but I'm telling you, if you don't want me to come in a war against you, that's what he said, fight against you is a term for war. If you don't want me in a war against you, you better repent and get rid of this doctrine of Balaam where you think it's okay to compromise and come together and fellowship with these that are unbelievers. Wow. Wow. There are still prophets and teachers today who hold the doctrine of Balaam. That is, for financial gain, they are teaching that it is good to participate in activity that Torah strictly forbids. And they do it for financial gain. That's the reason that Balaam did it. That's the reason they did do it. Those who want to obey Scripture should know that they cannot do that. They cannot obey Scripture and participate in Halloween. Those two things exclude one another. You right. cannot do them. Right. Scripture says that you cannot be yoked together with unbelievers. You cannot link faith with faithlessness, and you cannot link evangelism with seduction. <clears throat> Here's what I mean by that. Evangelism is teaching people everything Messiah lived and everything he taught. Right. Halloween is the seduction of evil. Right. You cannot use the seduction of evil to evangelize the lost. It's impossible to right. do that. Those two things cannot be yoked together. So number one, the yoke is unequal. Look in verse 14 of uh, 2 Corinthians 11, you'll see the second reason we're not to participate in Halloween. It says, for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? So reason number two is righteousness cannot fellowship with unrighteousness. Right. Look the word fellowship up. It's not the usual Greek word koine, which means to fellowship or to have in common. It's a Greek word, medoke, 
And metoke means, Strong says this, Strong says this word means intercourse. Okay. Thayer says it means to share and to have in common with, to be in, uh, in communion with. Righteousness and unrighteousness are not in communion with one another. They cannot be made uh, to join together. So here's the question. When, when he says, what fellowship is righteousness with unrighteousness? What is righteousness as defined by the law? Yahweh says, seek first the kingdom of Yahweh and his righteousness. That's what Messiah said. Seek first the kingdom of Yahweh and his righteousness. What is his righteousness? How do we know what's righteous and what's not righteous? Torah tells Torah. Us. Everything that Torah instructs us on, that's righteousness. It, it is declared over and over and over again to be the truth and to be righteousness. What is unrighteousness? What is sin? Sin is the transgression of the law. Every time. So unrighteousness is not doing the law. Righteousness is doing the law. So here's the question that, that Paul's asking in 2 Corinthians 11. He is saying, how can breaking the law and keeping the law have anything in common? It can't. Right. Let, let's talk about how absurd the whole idea is. <clears throat> Does the law say, thou shalt not murder? Okay. Does it also say, do not learn the way of the heathen? Right. Does it? Okay. Did Yahweh say, do not do to me or for me those things the heathens do to and for their deities? Yeah, he did say that. Okay. So in Jeremiah 10 and in Deuteronomy chapter 12, those two things are stated. Both of those are found in the Old Testament. <clears throat> and let me say all three of them are found in the Old Testament. But two of them are found in Torah. Deuteronomy 12 says... Uh, that we're not to learn the way uh, that that we are not to do to Yahweh those things that other people do for their Elohims. All right, and then in Exodus twenty it says you shall not murder. So both of those things are found in Torah. So if both of them are found in Torah, you cannot reject one right. without rejecting the other. That's correct. But people do reject the instruction about learning the ways of the heathen. And they justify it by saying this, where well, we're going to make it about Yahweh. We're going to learn the ways of the heathen. We're going to baptize that event. We're going to give it spiritual meaning, and we're going to use it for evangelism. Right? Right. Okay. Well, if that is okay, then logic dictates that the same thing would work concerning all of, of Yahweh's law. Murderers need to be reached too. So why not create evangelistic outreach teams made up of murderers who only murder so that they can reach other murderers? Or the next time there is a riot in a city and looting takes place. Looting is just a fancy word for stealing right. in a violent way. Right. Well, Torah says thou shalt not steal, right? Right. Well, if there's a city being taken over by rioters and, and they are stealing everything they can knock the windows out of, right. from every store they can knock the windows out of, why wouldn't you create an evangelistic outreach team who would go in and also steal so that they could reach yeah. stealers? Yeah. It's absurd, isn't it? Yes, sir. It's so absurd that our brain cannot even comprehend how deranged a person would have to be to even consider doing such a thing. Right. That's how deranged it is. But that is the point in 2 Corinthians 6. Learning the way of the heathen is unrighteousness. To try and learn their ways to reach them is absurd. Right. To say, yeah, that is evil, that is wicked, Halloween is pagan, but I'm going to learn it, and I'm going to dress it up a little bit, and I'm going to do it so I can reach them. 
It, it, that is no more absurd than saying, well, I'm going to learn how to steal so I can reach thieves. Right. You cannot become unrighteous in order to reach the unrighteous. Right. And that's what happens. Now, 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 let that point sink in. You cannot become unrighteous in order to reach the unrighteous. What is unrighteousness? Unrighteousness is that that we do in violation of Torah. Right. And so if Torah told me not to learn the ways of the heathen, if Torah told me not to take those ways and bring them over and use them in, in the worship and service of Yahweh, Torah told me not to do that, but I choose to do it anyway, and I choose to do it because I want to reach the unrighteous, I became unrighteous trying to reach the unrighteous. Right. You can't do that. Right. It's impossible to do that. Yahweh would certainly never bless it. Okay, I'm going to let you be, I'm going to let you go undercover. Police forces may do that. They may have vice teams they let go undercover and let them break the law so they can reach the, reach the lawless. Yahweh would never do that. No, sir. He will never let you go undercover <coughs> and break the law in order to reach the law. Right. It's impossible. You cannot become a person who participates in any part of Halloween in order to reach those who celebrate Halloween. You cannot do it. So, number three, also found in verse 14. And what communion has light with darkness? So, righteousness cannot fellowship with unrighteousness, and light and darkness have no communion. Th those two things cannot have fellowship. If there is darkness, it means what? There is no light. If there is light, it means what? There is no darkness. Halloween is darkness. Yes, sir. You cannot participate in it. You cannot let your light shine. This little light of mine, you can't let it shine yes, in, in Halloween. Right. Can't do it. Because it's darkness. If you're going to participate in it, you have to turn your light off to go participate in it. Right. <clears throat> People argue against this and say, no, 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 no. We're going to participate in it so that our light can shine in the darkness. But the truth is, the only way to let your light shine is to stand opposite of it and to oppose it. Right. To participate in it, you have to turn your light off. The moment you join in, your light gets el eliminated. I think I've shared this with you before. I'm pretty sure I have, but let me share it with you again. That we, we talked before about how hard it is. Not hard, that's the wrong word. But the effort that you have to have to, to, to walk away from pagan festivals. Right. Because there's all kind of tentacles you don't realize are there right. until you try to pull away from them. Yes, sir. And I'm talking about Easter, I'm talking about Christmas. Uh, you think, okay, I'm just going to break clean, but then year after year you find other tentacles right. that, that you have to just keep severing and say, no, I'm, when I say I'm free, I'm free of it. Right. Well, we, we had determined in our hearts that we were going to break free of Christmas. It was pagan, we weren't going to have anything to do with it. <clears throat> and, and, and all of us struggle with different parts of that, and, right. and there are different things that we have to work with for for Marie, it was particularly the light. She loves the light. Not the tree, but the light. She loved them around the house, around the windows, in the windows. She loved the lights. And, and she wanted to keep <clears throat> putting up the lights. She said, Hanukkah is the festival of lights. So I can keep my light. Because it's a festival of lights. I'm not celebrating Christmas. I'm celebrating Hanukkah. I said, I will not put them up. That's fine, I'll put them up. <laughs> and she did. But one night, we'd gone somewhere, and when we came home, we pulled into our subdivision. 803 Pettit Circle. And when we pulled into our subdivision late at night, that whole street's lit up for Christmas, right? I mean, there are lights and decorations everywhere. And as I went to pull into my driveway, I stopped and I backed up. And I looked at our house 
And I look at everybody else's house. And I said to Marie, they're celebrating Christmas, we're celebrating Hanukkah. Would anyone who sees our house think to themselves, wow, look at those folks, they're celebrating Hanukkah. Or would they look at our house and think we're just like everybody else? Yeah. To her credit, she couldn't get them down fast enough. She saw it, she took them down. Here's the point. By hanging those lights, by hanging those lights, we turned out our light as a witness to that community. And we began to have communion with darkness, not intending to do so. Well, it's the same with Halloween. I don't care what you call it. I don't care if you call it trunk or treat. I don't care if you call it a judgment house instead of a haunted house. I, I don't care if you dress up your child as a Bible character instead of a demon or ghost. Yeah. The fact remains when you choose to participate in it, your light gets turned off and you begin to have communion with darkness. Because the only way to let your light shine is to stand opposite of it and to oppose it. Right, right. So that those that look at you say, you're not participating. Why? Right. Now I can tell you. Right. But if I'm in here with you, mixed up in it, oh. and my little Johnny's dressed up like Joseph or David or somebody, yep. you don't know I'm any different than you. Right. If it were possible to use Halloween as an evangelistic outreach then the celebration of Halloween would begin to dwindle more and more and more. Mm -hmm. <coughs> more and more people would be turned off from it. More and more people would begin to reject it. You'd see less and less of it in the right. churches. But instead, it continues to grow and to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So evidently, the evangelism is not working. Right. Do you realize... <laughs> We're, we're going, our, our technology is going to get better and better. <laughs> May have. D did you know that Halloween is second only to Christmas in the revenue that it, that it generates yeah. in America? Yeah. It's getting bigger and bigger. It is. And more and more prevalent. There is no evangelism taking place. The, the very opposite is happening. Because the church has accepted it. It's growing. Right. Whereas had the churches opposed it, it would have right. dwindled. There's only light being eliminated so that they can have more fun in darkness. Number three. Excuse me, that was number three. Let's move to number four. Verse 15. What concord has the Messiah with Belial? So the fourth reason we can't participate in Halloween is <clears throat> the Messiah and Satan don't get along. Did you know that? Yeah. <laughs> They're not buddies. Right. You remember Luke chapter 4? Everything that Satan said to the Messiah, he said it as a contradiction of what Scripture actually right. said. Our Messiah never once agreed with him. Our Messiah always agreed with what was written. Right. Every time Satan would say something to him, he would say, it is written. Right. And he would tell him what the Word said, what Torah said. Satan says, do what you want to do. If it seems good to you or needful, just do it. Our Messiah overcame him by knowing and obeying what's written in the Scriptures. How has Halloween become so popular in our nation? How is it that a dark, demonic holiday has so much popularity even with churches? How is that possible? The answer is simple. 
once churches, and this happened in our lifetime, <clears throat> but once churches started teaching their people that they no longer needed to read the Old Testament, once churches started teaching their people, the law's passed away with, man, we're under grace, we're not under the law, you don't have to keep that anymore. Once churches started teaching people that, then, <clears throat> then people are, were, were able to embrace darkness. Where, where would such a teaching come from? Where would a teaching that says, oh, you don't have to pay attention to what's written right there. It would come from Belial. It would come, come from that worthless one. That's what Belial means. It comes from Satan. He started it in the garden, did he not? He did. He yea, hath Yahweh said. He, he's always contradicting Yahweh, and he's always trying to get people to believe they would be better off if they listened to their own heart instead of listening to Yahweh. Is that not what he said? Yeah. In the garden? Ah, oh, Yahweh just knows that if you eat of that fruit, you're going you're gonna to be wise. You're going you're gonna to have knowledge like him. Right? So he continues to do that today. He gets people to think, now you're smarter than what's written back there. We progress beyond what's written back there. You need to ignore what's written back there. And because people don't think they have to keep the law or do what's written in Torah, they've been deceived into thinking that they can participate without consequence in things such as Halloween, even though it is clearly forbidden. Right. And that's the problem, is when you open up the Bible and show them where it's clearly forbidden, what's the first thing they tell you? That's in the Old Testament. Yeah. That's the first thing they tell you. Right. The problem is that they are now listening to the doctrine of demons instead of uh, to the Messiah. Right. And the Messiah and, and the devil don't get along. And if you're listening to the doctrines of demons and ignoring what the Messiah is saying, and the Messiah lived and taught Torah, right. then you're fellowshipping with Belial, you're not fellowshipping with the Messiah. Right. The Messiah and Satan never agree and cannot work together to reach the lost. He will not work with the devil to reach the lost. He will not say, you know what, the old devil came up with that celebration right there. That's a pretty good celebration. You know, it, the kids love it. People love it. A lot of people come to this thing. So I tell you what, let's use that to reach people for me. No, sir. He doesn't need, won't, or have anything to do with the devil other than eliminating him in the end. Right. Mm. He doesn't need a satanic holiday to reach the law. No, sir. Amen. So, why do we not participate in Halloween? Umpteen reasons. Number one, the yoke is unequal. Number two, righteousness cannot fellowship with unrighteousness. Number three, light and darkness have no communion. Number four, the Messiah and Satan do not get along. Number five is found in verse 15. What part has he that believes with an infidel? So here's reason number five. You ready? A believer is a believer. This is deep now. A believer is a believer. An unbeliever is... An unbeliever. Right. The two terms are mutually exclusive. You're one or the other. You cannot be, well, I'm kind of a believer, but got some unbelief. And you can't be an unbeliever who believes a little bit. Here's what it says in the Greek. What does pistos and epistos share? Pistos and epistos. Pistos means to believe, apistos means to not believe. So the question is, how can you take believing and unbelieving and think they have something to share? They have nothing to share. They're reject. <laughs> one's accepting something, one's rejecting something. Are you with me? Yes, sir. <clears throat> you are a believer or you are an unbeliever? If you are a believer, that means what? Believe. You believe. All right, simple question. So let's ask another question. If you are a believer, that means you believe. What do you believe? Torah. You believe Torah. Somebody might say, well, I, I believe in the Messiah. Okay, let's go there. If you believe in the Messiah, how do you know who the Messiah is? Somebody might say, well, because of the Gospels. If the Gospels stood on their own, you would not know he's the right. Messiah. Right. The only way to know that he is the true Messiah is because of how 
Torah and the Tanakh showed you how to identify him and showed you why he was coming and what he was going to do right. and how he was going to do it and what he's yet to be done. Right. Yes. Right. So you cannot say, well, I'm a believer because I believe in the Messiah. If you believe in the Messiah, it's because Scripture tell, tells you to do so. Right. And if you believe the Scriptures tell you to do so, then you must believe all Scripture. Right. That's what it means to be a believer, is a, a believer believes all Scripture, and because you believe all Scripture, you know who the Messiah is, and you believe in the Messiah, and you believe in the one true Elohim. If it were not for Torah, if it were not for Scripture, you would not know who the true Elohim is. Right. You would have to go searching like so many people do, trying to find out what is real and what's not real. Who is the true Elohim, who's not the true Elohim? You know who the true Elohim is because of what this book tells you. Yes, sir. You, are you with me? Yes, sir. All right. If you believe the scriptures, then you must believe the part that says, do not learn the way of the heathen. Right. And if you say, well, I don't believe that, then you are no longer a believer who is evangelizing the lost. You are a non-believer doing what non-believers do. Let me say that again. If you are a believer, you have to believe what's written when it says, do not learn the way of the heathen. And if you say, well, I am a believer, but I don't believe that part, you just became an unbeliever. An unbeliever. And if you are an unbeliever, you are no longer a believer. And if you are no longer a believer, but you're participating in that that unbelievers participate in, then, then you are not evangelizing the lost. You're a non-believer doing what non-believers do, right. which is reject what the Scriptures say. I'm going to do what I want to do, and you can't stop me. That's what non-believers do. Right. Non-believers love religion. Are you with me? They love religion. It gives them a sense of belonging. And they, 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 they get a sense of being loved. They love religion. But they don't like being told what they can and cannot do. And so when it tells them they cannot do something that they want to do, they say, well, I don't believe that part. A believer believes the parts that say, do not. Yeah. All right. Drop down to verse 16 now. Let's get reason number six. We're almost to the umpteenth one. <laughs> verse 16. What agreement has the temple of Elohim or Yahweh with idols? So the sixth reason that we do not participate in Halloween is because Yahweh's temple is not a place for pagan images. The word translated agreement there, go look it up later. It's a, a very long Greek word. I, sometimes I say Greek words can get long, and this one's about as long as your arm. It's a big old Greek word. And, and, and this word means to deposit votes together. When would the temple of Yahweh ever agree to allow the image of another God inside of it? What happens to the temple of Yahweh when an image of another God is brought inside the temple? It defiles it or desecrates the temple, does it not? It has to be cleansed, and there's quite a process for cleansing it before it can be reused in the worship of Yahweh. Yes, sir. Right? Well, the temple, notice the temple is Yahweh's. So help me here. Who gets to decide what's in that temple? Yahweh does. Right. You go read the Exodus. When Moses was up on the mountain, Yahweh told him exactly how to build the tabernacle. He told him exactly the dimensions of every part of the tabernacle, the, the Holy of Holies as well as the, 
you know, the inner outward courts, all that stuff. He told him every piece of furniture that would be in it. Right. He told him what they would be made out of. He even told him how they would be carried. He told him how to uh, attach brackets to it and what brackets would be attached. He told him what brackets would hold what corner post up. Right. He, I mean, he went into great detail. Why? Because it's his. He even showed Moses, Here's, you're just going to build a pattern of what I have here. Let me show you what I have here. And he saw the pattern in heaven, and he built it on earth. The point is, the temple is Yahweh's, it's not man's. Yahweh's very direct about what could and could not be in it. And there was no vote. Right. Yahweh didn't say, Moses, go down, get with the people, find out what they'd kind of like to have in it. Yeah. Let's take a survey. What would you be looking for in a church if you were going to one? Mm. Come on. Yeah. That's the way they've grown them today. Right. Go through the community, take a survey. Well, why do you not go to church? Oh, well, what would you like to see in a church that would make you come back? Because we can put it in. Yahweh didn't take a boat, and he didn't take a survey. It's his temple. He set it up the way he wanted it to. And he certainly did not vote to let other gods be displayed inside of his temple. Right. 2 Corinthians 6 is calling upon us to consider that you and I are the temple of Yahweh. What does that mean? Well, it means that we are His temple. We were not a temple that He moved into. We were not walking around His temples and He thought, wow, that's a pretty good temple there. I think I'll move in there. No, He came and He reconstructed us yeah. you understand he recreated us he made us through rebirth not a temple but he made us his temple are you with me he still will not vote or agree to have us use other images in there to do stuff so, to do so would still contaminate the temple so here's the point that, that's being made here. That the point that I'm trying to make is that before you take Yahweh's temple to participate in a pagan festival, you should ask him if it's okay to go. Right. And the answer is no. You can ask him, but it's his temple. Yahweh, this is your temple can I take it and participate in a demonic activity in hopes of reaching the lost? His answer is no, my temple. Right. We're not going. Seventh reason. The seventh reason was Messiah was not a friend of publicans and sinners. He was the savior of them. We're going to find that in Luke chapter 7 if you want want to turn there I think we'll close with this one that's pretty close to umpteen reasons <laughs> a lot of times when people are creating activities such as fall festivals trunk or treats judgment houses a lot of times they will justify it by saying that we need to be more like the Messiah and be a friend to sinners but to say that Messiah was a friend of the publicans and sinners is a lie. Right. It is a widely held belief today that he was a friend of publicans and sinners, and therefore we also, to be like him, need to be a friend of publicans and sinners. But that is an absolute lie. It's a doctrine of devils. It is true that publicans and sinners followed him. It is also true that he had meals with publicans and sinners. But it is not true that he was their friend. Look in Luke chapter 7, verse 34. This is the Messiah himself speaking. He said this, The Son of Man is come eating and drinking, and you say, who says this? They did. Yeah. He, he's talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He said, here's what you say. You say, 
Behold a gluttonous man and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. He is, notice what Messiah is doing in verse 34. He is saying, you falsely accuse me right. of things that you ought not be accusing me of. Right. You call me gluttonous. That is one who's controlled by his appetite. One who <clears throat> overindulges in food. Was the Messiah gluttonous? No, sir. So this is a false accusation, is right. it not? They called him that, but he was not gluttonous. He said, you call me a wine bibber. Our term today would be a wino. He said, y'all accuse me of being a wino. Was our Messiah a wino? No, sir. No, of course he was not. But they called him a wine bibber, even though he was not a wine bibber. And then he says, you call me a friend of publicans and sinners. They're making that accusation against him, but the accusation is false, just like the accusation about him being gluttonous, and, <coughs> pardon me, and the accusation about him being a wine bibber. To, to see how false and how horrible an accusation this is, you have to look at the words. Anybody know what a publican was? Not a Republican. Anybody know what a publican was? It what? <laughs> A publican was a, a uh, Jewish man who joined with the side of Rome, uh, of the Roman government, and his job was to extract taxes from the Jewish people. He was paid by the Romans to go among his own people and to collect taxes. And I'm not talking about sending them a nice little letter. No. Whatever he had to do, he collected them, and most of them were known for being, uh, what's the word, unscrupulous. That is, Rome says to me, I need you to go get $100 from Bill this month for his taxes. Bill doesn't know what the Roman government said. Right. I come to Bill and say, hey man, you need I need $175 from you. Yeah. I ain't got $175. Well, you better sell something. Either that or I, I bring the Roman soldiers in here and you ain't going to like that. Yeah. So Bill costs up $175. I give $100 to the Roman government. I put $75 in my pocket. Right. I go to the next house. So a publican is a betrayer. Excuse me, a publican is a betrayer. A sinner is what? First John 3 defines a sinner for us every time. Sin is a transgression of the law. So a sinner is anyone who transgresses the law of Yahweh. The word tr uh, translated friend there is the Greek word philos. P-H-I-L-O-S. Philos. And the word philos means to be very fond of. So listen to the accusation. The accusation they leveled against the Messiah is that you're very fond of people who oppress the Jews, and you're very fond of people who transgress Yahweh's law. Those are the people you call friends. Wow. That's a hateful, mean, horrible accusation. The accusation was made by his enemies. He did not own up to it. He did not say, well, yeah, that's who I am. No. No, he is refuting that accusation they're making against him. Anybody that said he was a friend of sinners in that day and time was his enemy. Right. And it's still his enemies who make that accusation right. today. Those then who called him the friend of sinners and those today who call him the friend of sinners are the enemies of Messiah. Now, now once the, the, there was a time in Matthew 9, if you want to turn there, we'll look at that. There was a time the Pharisees questioned his motives for allowing the sinners to eat with him. Let's go there and read that, because his answer is very telling. Are you there? Yes. Matthew 9, look in verse 19. Excuse me, look in verse 9. And as Yeshua passed from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. You know what that means? 
Ma Matthew was a publican. He said unto him, follow me, and he arose and followed him. If Matthew was a publican, who would his friends have been? Other publicans. Verse 10. It came to pass, as Yahushua sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, why eat your master with publicans and sinners? sinners. But when Yahushua heard that, he said unto them, they that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Go ye and learn what that means. I'll have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now listen to what the Messiah said in the presence of those who had come to eat with him at Matthew's house. He refers to them as being sick. Yep. They need a physician. He also referred to them as being sinners. Right? Right. What did he say that he was come to do with them? I have come to call them to righteousness. To call them to repentance. Are you with me? Yes, sir. All right. They followed him. He did not go where they were. Right. He did not find the activities that they were putting on and go in and disguise himself and say, I'm going to just try to become one of them to reach them. Right. He, he went to Matthew where Matthew was and said, come, follow me. When Matthew followed him and, they, and went and sat down to eat, all of Matthew's friends followed and sat down to eat. And when he's questioned about this, Messiah said, how can you take this and twist it and make it look like the Messiah is a friend of those who oppress the Jews and fond of those who transgress the law? Yeah, Messiah, when he's questioned about it, Messiah said, they're sick and they need help. And I've come to call them to repentance because they're transgressing the law of Yahweh. Yeah. There's the problem. There's the problem with modern day evangelism. Modern, modern day evangelism doesn't want to offend anybody. Right. Modern day evangelism doesn't want to call anybody a sinner. Modern day evangelism doesn't want to say anything that might make somebody feel guilty and get up and walk out. Modern day evangelism doesn't even want them to have to open their Bibles and read them because that might make them feel bad. Messiah called them what they was and made it clear what he was there to do, and what he was there to do was to call them to repentance. Amen. Wow. If you go back and look now at our text, and look in verse 17. It says this, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate says Yahweh, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I'll be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith Yahweh Almighty. That message is not getting preached enough in our day and time. Come out from among them and be separate. It doesn't say go in among them and try to change what they're doing to have some kind of spiritual meaning. It says come out from among them and be separate. Right. We've got to separate ourselves from it. We can't participate in it and help them. Come out from among them, be ye separate. Touch not the unclean thing. Then I'll receive you. I'll be your father. You'll be my sons and daughters, says Yahweh Almighty. That's what Yahweh says. Amen. <clears throat> Paul made this point in another place, and, and uh, it's in the Corinthians. Second uh, Corinthians, I think. Uh, but Paul said this. <clears throat> He was talking about the apostles in his day and time. Excuse me. So-called apostles in his day and time. He, apostles and ministers. And, and he said of them that, that they are apostles and ministers of, of darkness and of the devil and of Satan himself. But yet they're coming among you trying to get you to follow them. He said, it's no great deal that they transform themselves. That is, 
they come across as being ministers of righteousness. He says, no big deal. It's no great thing that they do that and they're able to get away with it because Satan himself has transformed himself into an angel of light. He said, so his ministers... Let's, let's just read that. Hold on just a second. Yeah, 2 Corinthians 11. Let's read it. I don't want to mess this up. Let's read it. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of the Messiah. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, everybody say with me, his ministers. His ministers. Satan has preachers. Right. Satan has apostles. Yeah. But it's no great thing if his ministers be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their work. When a minister claiming to represent, and that's what it says here, to be an apostle of the Messiah, claiming to represent the Messiah, when a minister claiming to represent the Messiah is trying to get you to participate in activities that are born of Satan himself, he's a minister of Satan, yes. right. not a minister of the Messiah. Amen. I don't know how we can get any more plain than that. <laughs> and we don't have to get loud to make that point. I did. But we don't have to. I mean, it's, we can read it real quietly and it still says the same thing. Yes, sir. That, that there, Satan has ministers out there trying to get people to compromise. He used Balaam. And he's still using apostles and prophets and ministers today who are trying to get people to participate in things that Torah forbids. Mm -hmm. Right. It makes them wealthy. It brings destruction on the people. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Folks, we got umpteen reasons not to participate in Yes, sir. Stand up. I get I get loud sometimes because when especially when I go to talking about preachers and I do that because I've talked to too many of them too too many of them who will say well yeah I know that's right but I'd lose a lot of people if I told them that wow wow so they're hiding truth from their people well, they're not a minister of the Messiah if they're hiding truth. Right. I'm not saying they're a minister of Satan. But the scripture says, sure says they are. Right. So I guess I am because I'm a believer. Yes, sir. I believe what it says. Yes, sir. It says they're ministers of Satan. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. As his name is put upon you, so shall he bless you. Isn't that good to know? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. To be blessed of Yahweh. Shabbat shalom. Have a wonderful afternoon. You're dismissed.